Well, joining us today is Melanie Harris, AIA. She's a, uh, the National Healing Practice Director uh, for BSA Life Structures, a great uh, uh, firm that's very distinguished in the healthcare field. And uh, Melanie is going to be talking to us uh, from her Tampa uh, uh, office, if you will, about something. She sent us an essay about uh, her concerns regarding uh, the situation after uh, George Floyd was killed and uh, the whole Black, Life Matter, Black Lives Matter uh, episodes uh, uh, resulted. And um, we're going to be publishing that on our website uh, for everybody. But Melanie, tell us a little bit about your background and why you're so concerned as an architect about, uh, about these issues. Sure, absolutely. So Rob, as you can see, I'm a brown woman. Uh, my my background is I was born in India. I grew up in India. Um, I lived there for a very long period of time. Um, and when I moved to the US, um, I was anxious about a lot of things, right? Um, it's a completely different culture for a person like me who has only ever grown up in India. Um, there's a lot that I had to learn and I knew I did. Um, I already had a bachelor's in architecture when I moved to India and um, we build things very differently in India. So I was concerned about how I was going to do in the US. Uh, but one of the things that I never really considered was the color of my skin and how people will look at me when I move to the US. Um, discrimination was not necessarily on my radar at all. Um, but when I moved here, um, again, I had opportunities that a lot of other people in the US and in India don't necessarily have. Um, my parents set me up to be able to do my master's here. Um, I you know, chose the field of architecture, which a lot of the times tends to be more diverse than a lot of other fields. Um, and I never really felt that. Um, I was always treated with respect um, and my colleagues and I worked very well together. Uh, but recently, as we all know, um, the death of George Floyd has brought to the forefront what discrimination and inequity in this country can look like and feel like. Um, and to me, as a brown person and as a woman, um, there's a multitude of things that could cause discrimination. Um, and this is really important for me to follow through. And architecture is the tool that I hope to use yeah. um, in doing that. You, 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 uh, you mentioned the phrase uh, building equity through design. That, that's what you feel you can do uh, as a, uh, uh, a, a, an alumnus of uh, Texas A&M and uh, all the professional work you've done. So how, how can, what can architects do? You've got kind of this uh, four point manifesto that you've, that you've written. Uh, tell us uh, uh, what, what, the, what each of these points is and what you think the profession and individual architects should be doing uh, as a result of uh, what we're seeing in, uh, uh, in the larger picture. Absolutely. To me, you know, as architects, we design places that people occupy for a large period of their lives. Um, be it be residences, hospitals, schools, we spend a lot of our times in the edifices that architects create. Um, so there's the four things that you're talking about. This is definitely not the end all be all, but to me, they're kind of the basic steps that we can take to help with the equity. Um, and the first one is designing for the people. Um, in architecture, we are taught to design to the context, to the site, mm -hmm. um, to a lot of constraints like schedule um, and finances. But the one thing that we really need to pay attention is who are the people this design is serving. Can you give um, me an example of how to sure. better design for, for people? Absolutely. One of the best examples that I've had in my career is I was a young architect. I was working on designing a clinic in a disenfranchised neighborhood. Um, and my senior designer said, you know, we need to provide larger rating spaces for than the industry standard for this um, clinic. And I asked why. And they said, most of the families in the neighborhood that we were designing in are not nuclear families. They are large extended families where the grandparents, the, all the children in the family, they all come to the clinic visits together. Yeah. Um, so you can design for one or two people who are waiting in the waiting areas. You have to design for six or seven people. Um, and keeping that in mind, who are the people, what kind of neighborhoods you're working on, 
Are they nuclear families? Are they big families that cannot afford childcare? Um, is exceptionally important. All right, let's talk about the other points uh, very uh, as, as br briefly as possible. Sure. Uh, yeah. um, the other one is empower the people. So if you're, you are working in a neighborhood, let's look at instead of moving the people out of that neighborhood, um, and that does occur in gentrification a lot, right. um, let's figure out how to give them initiatives that would help them develop and stay in that neighborhood, like urban farms and green energy sources at a discount. Um, the third one is staying invested in the community. And a big part of this is do we go back to the communities after we design something for them and see how they're continuing to do. So post-occupancy evaluations on, let's say, very basic- Hooray, hooray, post-POEs. POEs are we're important. Big, we're and big advocates of that because, you know, does the building work? Does the building work for the people that you've designed it for? Right. Yeah, okay. And what's the exactly. last point? Exactly, and you might have felt you did and yeah, and you might have thought you did an amazing design, but let's go back and find out, right? Um, and then the last one is striving for inclusion. Let's not use spaces like parks and plazas to separate neighborhoods because that's based on fear. Um, that's based on wanting to keep people um, apart. Let's use those as a tool for integration uh, instead of what we, are, we typically tend to do with it. So those are the four points, designing for the people, empowering the people, staying invested in the communities, and then striving for inclusion. It's a, it's a, a points that I, I'm sure many of uh, designers and others in our audience are, are trying to do, but it's a good reminder that uh, the, these are important things to keep in mind as you're, as you're working on projects. Any final thoughts about uh, what you're gonna be doing or how you're gonna be using these in your, in your practice? Absolutely. So you mentioned I work for BSA Life Structures. A big tenant of ours is that we are creating inspired spaces that people live in, which is why it's called Life Structures. Um, and given that, let's make sure that as architects, we are empowering these life structures to help people of all, um, all you know, let's not discriminate against any kind of people, all races, all sex sexes, all genders and economic statuses. So we're definitely putting in an effort on that. Um, we do healing, discovery, and learning. Those are three really important market sectors. And we make sure that all of the tenants that we, I talked about are incorporated to some degree or the other in all of them. And it's okay. always about baby steps, right? right. Let's start taking those steps towards them. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we've been speaking with Melanie Harris from BSA Life Structures about her four-point manifesto for architects. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.